So thank you, everybody. It was, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and being invited by Isola Design in this amazing location and, uh, and talk about uh, design, what we do in Frog, and, uh, and really share with you some of uh, the innovation and the prospects for the future that we see relevant for us. Um, today, together with me, there is uh, uh, Cara. Uh, myself, I'm uh, Mariano Cucchi. I'm uh, Associate Design Director in, uh, in Frog in the Milan uh, Center of Excellence. And uh, my background is in product design. Nowadays, I'm a design director that uh, deals with uh, uh, projects related to new product development and connected uh, things and, uh, and new services associated for that. And uh, Cara, I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. Hello. I'm Cara Pecknold. I'm an executive design director. And while I do a lot of things, one of my primary focuses is to really be a global lead for sustainability and advocate that across our design disciplines, but also in strategy and technology. So thanks for having us. So in this hour, we will cover two big topics. Uh, one is about uh, convergent design and uh, the connected future prospects that we see in uh, uh, like connected products. And then we will have uh, uh, by Cara, uh, a deep dive into sustainability and uh, some of the thinking around that. Let's start with uh, convergent design and connected future. Um, in Frog, uh, we have uh, nowadays like uh, more than 50 years of experience in uh, new product innovation. We have been uh, grown as an industrial design company. And in these uh, more than 50 years, we had really evolved from uh, thinking product that were beautiful, functional, and uh, really adopting new technology into uh, something that is much uh, bigger than that, uh, especially considering that uh, nowadays, uh, uh, connectivity, uh, the advancement in technology, the miniaturization of things, and, um, and really the progress in uh, new, new technologies has, uh, has asked designers to embrace uh, new thinking, um, asking industries to change and also introducing new business models. We know by data that uh, the connected age is, uh, is booming and uh, more and more we'll have uh, products that are connected and enable new type of services and we see that uh, in, uh, in automotive with the future of uh, the connected car, in smart home, more and more we, we uh, have the objects and uh, new products that uh, make our home uh, smarter. Uh, in healthcare also as well, we have uh, a, the big promise of uh, uh, predicting our condition and, and reacting to, um, to really uh, our potential future disease thanks to like connected objects. And then also factories are becoming smarter and introducing uh, uh, digital technologies. All of these are uh, uh, really asking designers to, um, to approach uh, new, develops in div new development in a different way. Products today are uh, really more and more uh, a part of uh, a larger ecosystem where it's not just about designing a beautiful product, uh, something that has an harmony in terms of uh, shape, but it's, uh, it's really introducing uh, larger services and, uh, and, and user experiences that need to be designed and well-crafted and orchestrated in a, at a deep level. We have demonstration of that, uh, uh, of this new generation of products in all these domains. Uh, it's about Tesla in car, uh, kitchen is moving into, like uh, cooking especially, is moving into much more precision cooking and art of, uh, of cooking thanks to new tools. Uh, gaming is, uh, is changing and introducing also new type of interfaces. Uh, the case of Nintendo is definitely one of the best uh, uh, in terms of new type of uh, um, shift from uh, console into smart console that adapt to different gaming modes. And then, of course, when we talk about ecosystem, Amazon is, uh, is definitely a great example. And, um, and it's, um, it's interesting to see how they are evolving their product lines, introducing new category of, 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 of objects like, uh, like smart robots in the home. But um, what, what's the meaning behind connected things? Why do we need uh, uh, smart technology embedded in objects? Uh, there are several reasons that brings value to, to user experience. One is about sensing in real time. 
Uh, so uh, objects that can really inform the user on their condition, being uh, the product or the environment. It's about uh, uh, introducing artificial intelligence as a way of processing certain tasks and help the user um, have uh, the control by new type of machines about workflows and, uh, and tasks that uh, are complex and require computing as, a, as an element of, uh, of delivery. And then uh, it's also about connecting objects among them. So it's, uh, it's not just one object, but it's the logic of connectivity across families. Um, one other important aspect is uh, uh, shifting the computing from uh, the object into like uh, the cloud. And so one element of connectivity of value is definitely being connected to the network, being uh, really shifting uh, the, the processing to the cloud to deliver even even higher level of, uh, of complexity in computing. And definitely the, the, the most important reason why we are moving over a connected age is because connected objects generate data that inform uh, how uh, new businesses and how consumers are, uh, are behaving and, and help companies to evolve uh, and provide even more value. In Frog, our mission in this domain is really helping clients uh, embracing the opportunities and the potential of uh, this new world. What are uh, really the values? What are the, the struggles, the difficulties in implementing these technologies and really shape uh, the future uh, in the best way, in the best uh, uh, way of thinking uh, the ideal user experience. And we do that uh, really across uh, several categories. Uh, it's about consumer products, it's about uh, wellness, uh, healthcare, um, it's about industrial application, and it's also spaces. Our merit is really that uh, we, we cross over many industries and we really leverage our contamination of learnings in these industries to, to innovate. But what's the challenge when we deal with this type of development? Uh, honestly, it's not just about taking uh, an interaction designer, an industrial designer, having them uh, doing their own part and then we get the connected object. It's much more complex than that. It's not about, uh, okay, you have a nice design, embed some hardware sensors and uh, some digital app uh, and it's done. It's, uh, it's actually much larger. When we think about how objects are evolving nowadays, uh, we have multi-layers that need to be well thought through. Uh, we can say that uh, on one side, it's uh, the evolution of the expression of the object. The designer has always been considered as the one that makes nice things, but uh, the expressions of an object now are changing, are not anymore static. Uh, objects are not uh, silent anymore, beautiful things that you put in a corner of your house, but uh, they are alive and uh, they are much more dynamic, they change based on your different tasks, uh, they change uh, in terms of how they propose you to do certain things. And that has, this has definitely a strong impact in terms of uh, brand resonance. What's the brand expression and what kind of uh, design we need to have to communicate certain values of the brand. Of course, behind this type of uh, expression of hardware and software, we have uh, at the end uh, the design of a use case of uh, really designing new behaviors uh, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our life that is uh, full of things to do and, uh, and we need to think practically about uh, having uh, opportunity for convenience, emotion and really uh, solving problems. And in doing that we, we use technology as an enabler to really address these, uh, these, uh, these issues. But uh, integrating technology is not uh, that easy. Sometimes uh, the effect of dealing with the performance of the technology, the size uh, and, uh, and uh, definitely the usability, the interaction model is, is critical. And ultimately it's about uh, creating a relationship uh, uh, with the machine. So we need to design the intelligence uh, of the object, uh, meaning what kind of relationship we want to have with the artificial intelligence, uh, with uh, the computing power of the machine, what is the manifestation of that? And, uh, and also what kind of data is then generated and how do I use it, how is it valuable for me. So when you think this uh, multi-dimension uh, spectrum uh, from uh, designing the expression, the quality of the aesthetics, considering all these layers, and, uh, and the intelligence, the, the functionality around the computing power, the hardware and software, 
all of this is, is very, it's very hard uh, and uh, it needs really a systemic view to be thought through. And, uh, and to address this uh, in FROG, we have uh, the convergent design methodology and practice. It's more, it's more really a philosophy of, uh, of really integrating uh, uh, different disciplines uh, uh, that uh, can deliver on, uh, on these challenges. Uh, mainly it's about really uh, having uh, the industrial design, the dealing with the physical objects uh, and uh, also the digital interfaces, but it's, it's larger than that. It's really about integrating uh, multiple perspectives over the project and really lead uh, to innovation in a convergent way. We have the business side of things where we have uh, strategists and service designers that think more the use case, what's the, the reason why you should have such a new category in the market. There is uh, people. Uh, we start always from people understanding human needs and by running uh, design research and also involving more and more behavioral designers, we kind of try to go around what's the need and design uh, to bring value to people. We mentioned about brand as a, an important element that is uh, leading the expression of the product. And then um, the technology side uh, where uh, different type of technologies uh, from engineers dealing with uh, the mechanics uh, to software developers and architects, uh, we really try to understand what is the right level of technology that we need in a specific product. And ultimately, the goal is to design an experience in a holistic way. So uh, it's, uh, it's good in terms of physical interaction. It's good in terms of uh, uh, dealing with software. And, um, and, and, and really, when you look at the product, you see a certain level of integrity and, uh, and intelligence that, that is reasonable. We were doing this in a way, this uh, contamination of disciplines in the early days when Armut Esslinger, the founder of Frog, was dealing with the mechanical engineers of the team to really push the frontier of uh, form and development uh, of uh, technology integration. And we are still doing it today very much. Designers work with technologies hands in hands to develop conversion prototypes where we use um, different type of technology to experiment what the experience would be and, uh, and really see uh, these as a stimuli also to, to probe to end users to understand the future of the experience. The five uh, pillars that we have around this process are really around these, uh, uh, um, these, these key uh, like elements. It's about people and then uh, it's really addressing their needs and behaviors. It's about thinking always the business outcome, so really embracing strategy as, as a creative act. Uh, where uh, we see opportunities that, uh, that inspire our thinking, our creativity. We design thinking systems, so it's not just one object, but it's really the, the, the system of things uh, being a digital and physical touch point around that and how they can really speak a common language. It's about technology integration and uh, shaping uh, what kind of uh, best uh, uh, technology integration we can have. And, uh, and then the brand impact that is uh, Ultimately, sometimes the reason why people get in love uh, with, with products because uh, they see the values of a brand really meeting uh, closely their needs. When we think about uh, what kind of items, what kind of artifacts we have in this, uh, uh, in this practice, uh, um, we can call out for different archetypes that uh, try to map out uh, all the different type of things that we design that are connected. And we shift uh, uh, basically from one pole of the range where it's about designing interactive machines, where the intelligence is very much embedded, it's integrated in the product. Uh, it's basically the new shape of, uh, of computers that uh, are uh, helping us in, in our task and they provide directly on the device a certain interface. And on the opposite side, it's more about uh, the distributed intelligence. So it's not in one product, but uh, the technology, the intelligence is really spread across multiple touch points. And uh, what is going to be very important there is the service perspective and the integration of the technology in a larger ecosystem. And then in the middle, we have devices. And uh, we have projects that are related to inventing a new connected device, where uh, it's about integrating a new technology that uh, can become a new companion, for example, for users, or it's more about connected ecosystem of devices where the focus is not anymore about on one device, but how different objects uh, speak together. And uh, here we can see some example of the work we do. Uh, when we think about interactive machine, it can be about uh, 
the future of the connected car? How do we really create a relationship with an assistant, for example, in the dashboard of the car? Or on the opposite is maybe the new generation of medical equipment where it's really about understanding what kind of clinical workflow needs to be kept in mind for the designer to shape the new type of interactions. And, and also more and more we will have uh, smart kiosks that will provide services and uh, they also tease us new ways of maybe uh, interacting and, uh, and uh, um, probing maybe some question to, for a service. It's about really defining uh, what the appropriate interface is in that context uh, and, uh, and validate then uh, a specific use case uh, through prototype. The connected devices is really about uh, shaping uh, like the new companions of our life. It can be recorders of our life uh, in terms of devices that uh, look at what is uh, happening around us and inform and assist us. It can be about uh, uh, new companions that, uh, that really uh, come with us and, um, and uh, help uh, in, in our task uh, with new type of interactions and uh, with uh, hopefully also changing some, uh, some bad practices or uh, uh, try to help us in our life. Ecosystem uh, of devices present other type of challenges. Here it's not about integrating one technology, but it's really thinking more how a certain product family uh, is uh, integrated in terms of uh, expressions, is, uh, is consistent about uh, uh, what each product does and really creates a network effect so that uh, the product family works together. Uh, we can see this in uh, household appliances, we can see in uh, like a family of our smart toys or really in the connected smart home where different things need to be synced uh, around our routines of the daily life. And ultimately intelligent spaces is really more about uh, thinking uh, really the experience in, uh, in a different dimension. It's not anymore the in single interaction with the product, but more how do we feel uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a larger space uh, and how the brand maybe is really using the space to convey a certain uh, feeling, a certain experience. And, um, and, and of, often the task here is, uh, is also how can we bridge uh, more and more an experience in real life in a space with the experience that we have uh, online, that's the case of e-commerce that is more and more becoming popular, but we still need uh, to get to the store to have and feel uh, the real interaction with the object. And, and the, the, the key challenge here is how can we build uh, a bridge between this in real life and offline and, and online experience. So this is a bit of uh, the work that we do in Frog about uh, like a new smart product and services. But uh, I want to try to pitch uh, forward uh, like uh, our view to the future and see other frontiers that could become opportunity for high convergent design, innovation, and really think a different connected future that needs to be designed and, uh, and, uh, and needs to be created. One element, as I said, is about uh, leveraging the value of data. Uh, it's, it's interesting to generate data, but for which reason? How can we make them valuable? And the, the answer is really that uh, we need to have uh, out of data actionable insights that are really helping us in, uh, in solving some, uh, some of uh, our, our tasks, our challenges. It's the case, for example, of uh, uh, this type of uh, life recorders that uh, senses us how, when we do sport and then they inform uh, in different ways uh, uh, how, how our body is uh, behaving and, uh, and, and really tell us how we should maybe consider training in a different way. This can happen at different levels. It can be by interfaces that are very expressive, very visible through an app uh, and the device itself that conveys a certain data. Or it can be done in a very more silent and discreet way. It's the case of, for example, of Hoop uh, that is a kind of a revolutionary uh, wellness device because uh, with its uh, simplicity it's informing at the right point when do you need for example to recover for your hard uh, workout and so here we see that uh, we have different choices and the designer needs to really craft uh, what's the appropriate experience what's the right level of relationship with the artificial intelligence and what then is the product expression how does it uh, really communicate to the end user 
ultimately these are uh, data points uh, that the object is generating, but uh, the essence is that these data points need to become learnings for the end user in order to make them uh, aware of what's going on and then from there really understand how to change. Uh, building a certain level of trust with the technology because the data is exposed contextually to what is happening and then from there learning and, and really acting in a different way. It's the case of the project we did for a startup in Israel that invented this uh, device uh, for uh, tracking metabolism where basically the big promise is about uh, able to listen, be able to listen uh, what uh, our body is consuming, whether it's carbs or, uh, or fat, and then inform uh, the end user on how to have a different lifestyle, what to eat, uh, when to eat, uh, when there is, for example, a performance, a sport performance uh, upcoming. And what we did here was really trying to have some key moral hero moments in the experience where uh, the user gets uh, much more knowledge about what's going on and then more and more take action, takes action and, uh, and uh, uh, reaches different new uh, goals uh, in, in the journey of change. But this is very much like at the consumer level. What if uh, we have to deal with data for uh, uh, the like uh, industrial IoT, for example, where we have machines that uh, are collecting a lot of data points and uh, the goal is not so much about the behavior change of a user but more addressing a new level of analysis around performance. We can definitely imagine uh, a new generation of data visualizations where uh, um, the, the user can really explore data, can navigate uh, the data points and then collaborate with the artificial intelligence to understand what insights, what learnings we can have from data and uh, through visualization and new tools uh, really improve uh, uh, the next generation of, of things. So one of the big uh, frontier of uh, connected things is definitely around uh, dealing more and more with data science, dealing more with uh, the power of artificial intelligence and, and create collaboration uh, with, uh, with the end user. Another big topic that is very much on the hype nowadays is, uh, is uh, how to design for the metaverse. And uh, this is uh, an area that is very much speaking about convergence of disciplines because it's not uh, in the domain of uh, the physical designers, neither completely in the domain of the digital designers. When we deal with the metaverse, it's about uh, shaping very kind of uh, shared spaces where we have eventually three-dimensional interactions with things as well as uh, uh, the power of digital that uh, overlays on, uh, on re real life. And um, we have since a decade uh, uh, got used to design objects, especially smart technologies that have uh, another life in the digital as, uh, as like a digital twin. So representation of what's the product doing that allows to simulate, uh, predict uh, how the product will perform. It's the case of industrial machines, and this is a project we did uh, with Comao um, here in Italy, where we designed this machine and thought also uh, the potential of uh, this application through a digital twin, a solution that allows to really understand, predict, uh, and plan uh, what you could do with, with the machine. But this was very much like uh, moving from physical to digital. Uh, it's a real product, and then there is uh, another uh, another twin, another um, manifestation of that product in digital, in digital world. What we are observing nowadays, though, is that uh, the opposite is also changing. In other domains, uh, here it's more about consumer goods, but uh, brands are uh, creating products online for the metaverse, for uh, another dimension, where there are other concepts uh, uh, and, um, and the digital allow really to explore different uh, potential of what the product could be, to then at some point move from the digital, the object uh, that is uh, virtual uh, in, uh, in the metaverse, to become at some point a forged item that is uh, part of an exclusive collection. That's the case of uh, the Nike Crypto Kicks that were released as uh, uh, very expensive NFTs to buy. And then ultimately, these, uh, some of these models uh, will be also let's call it them forged and made them real as, as real products. And, and here it's interesting to see a different shift of uh, 
uh, from digital to physical and, uh, and how much uh, there is an element of, um, of, uh, of innovation around the, the concept of scarcity about uh, like a, a dedicated collection of things where a single item can be super, uh, super um, achieved uh, by, by like uh, uh, precious NFTs that, uh, that have a high, high cost. Uh, but also a very high value in terms of status. And, um, and the interesting part is uh, what's the, again, the expression of these type of solutions in the digital in terms of uh, superpowers uh, that you can have uh, in the digital world that can also be reflected in, uh, in, the, in the real world. So this, uh, this uh, moving from physical to digital and back, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, one to observe and to design. And ultimately, the metaverse uh, best expression, I think it's about uh, uh, designing uh, mixed reality experiences where it's not just about isolating ourselves in the virtual or having a physical uh, object that has uh, a digital life, but it's really maybe thinking experiences where we use the digital to complement what we cannot achieve over the beauty of our physical world. Of course, here we are still uh, very much uh, behind and it's, uh, it's really about uh, developing the technology, but it's interesting uh, the scenario and the use case that we need to design. Uh, here, for example, we see uh, the division of spectacles uh, uh, that created these uh, AR glasses and, uh, and they are releasing them to creators to investigate what could be scenarios of the future and how augmented reality could be used to interact uh, and delight uh, users in, in new ways. So this was like the metaverse. But um, when I think about connected uh, products, I can imagine also any other interesting trend and, uh, and potential new trajectory to think about, which is about uh, smart materials and what I call active matter. Uh, so we always think about materials again as a passive elements uh, that uh, are uh, uh, having specific properties but what if uh, these materials are actually having embedded uh, the new technology that allows new type of interactions what if uh, like uh, we have new interaction models with things because these smart materials this is the case of a startup that developed this technology to basically create uh, a potential uh, interaction of a la on a larger surface uh, by using uh, the listening of uh, the vibrations of, uh, of the human in interaction in order to trigger certain behavior of, of the product. Uh, by having uh, uh, sensors uh, uh, embedded in the, in the surface, you can really listen uh, specific uh, movements of the hands, specific uh, behaviors of the user, and then from there reacting in a specific way. This, of course, it's introducing a new type of interaction model thanks to uh, smart materials that uh, are, are used and the technology embedded in that. But then we have uh, uh, research labs that are uh, really working strong uh, on uh, other new technologies where the material is uh, is not anymore a passive thing, but is programmed, uh, is uh, designed in a way that it can react given specific uh, environment uh, uh, stimuli or uh, like uh, specific conditions and, uh, and signals uh, of control by the end user. Is the case of 4D printing for uh, like uh, a, a new type of wood that can bend depending on the, the condition of humidity and react really in a, in a different way so it can be fabricated as a flat and then activate and form uh, when it's needed. Or it's about like uh, e-textiles, a, a new type of textile that is uh, created with uh, different uh, behaviors uh, for uh, the fibers that uh, move and adapt uh, depending on the uh, temperature and environment condition. Uh, so based on humidity and light, uh, the, the, the garment adapts uh, and, and really allow a certain level of ventilation. Another interesting project is about uh, soft robotics. Uh, we tend to think about uh, robots as a, a collection of uh, different components and uh, hardcore hardware that is assembled uh, with electronics and mechanics. But um, uh, we, we see like research projects really uh, trying to explore the role of soft robotics that uh, uses certain materials as a printed elements 
and, um, and basically allow another level of flexibility and, and behaviors of, of this type of, of machines. So what if uh, the new generation of products will introduce this type of smart materials? And uh, another perspective of materials is about definitely uh, the logic of sustainability, about the fact that uh, materials can be at some point uh, maybe reused, uh, recycled, or disassembled and reconfigured for certain uh, uh, applications. This is the case of a few projects, uh, um, uh, uh, still a research project here done by the uh, University of Tokyo where Basically, the concept is really leveraging the power of material composites that have different properties mixed together. And, uh, and here, for example, the concept of self-healing was explored. But also, the interesting uh, part of this project is that uh, uh, this material can easily disassemble and get reconfigured. And thanks to the self-healing property, you can uh, really remelt uh, the object to construct, construct new interactions uh, and, and UIs. And then on the other side, on the, on, on, on the right, you f we see something that is very uh, or, uh, real and concrete on the market. It's uh, a new concept uh, uh, for uh, building boats that use uh, like uh, bioplastics. Uh, and, uh, and the interesting part of bioplastics that uh, in this case would substitute fiberglass is that uh, at some point of the end of life of the product, uh, you can decompose uh, the matrix uh, that is uh, a thermoplastic material from the fiber in order to reuse uh, uh, those materials and, um, and maybe rebuild uh, uh, the object. So materials are definitely an area that uh, it's very um, uh, stimulating for the designer because uh, we have uh, uh, elements of interactivity, not just in terms of uh, uh, like uh, what kind of actions, what kind of... Uh, um, mm, reactions we, we have from uh, like smart products, but also because they they really have an impact in terms of uh, of lifetime, uh, and um, and and they really rules the type of construction and fabrication that the designer needs to think. These are uh, uh, some uh, frontiers that uh, speak very much about uh, the importance and the power of convergence of different disciplines to shape the future that we have ahead uh, is not anymore about one designer that uh, invents something but it's really the contamination of uh, different uh, disciplines and different uh, frontiers of research in order to to think the future and um, we like in frog to to say make your mark by by really embracing innovation embrace user center uh, research and, and design uh, for, for uh, a better future. And with this, and especially this uh, closing on sustainability and materials, I leave the word to Cara to speak more specifically about uh, the future of sustainability. Thank you. Thanks, Mariana. So Mariana told you all the things you could make, and I'm gonna tell you what kind of a designer you should be. Um, because I think we at our, we're at a real crossroads in what it means to make things and to maybe make too many things. So a bit of a provocation, perhaps a bit philosophical this afternoon. Um, so I hope you'll, you'll join me in this journey. I think it's interesting. We think sustainability is something that's really, you know, just now. It's current. It's a big conversation now. But as you can see, and this is not even the oldest data point, um, Victor Papanuk talking about it back in 1971. If we are to be in our design ecologically responsible and socially responsive, it must be revolutionary and radical. And sometimes that's hard to do. It's still hard to do even in these in these days. How many of you have seen this squiggly line before in your studies or as a designer? A few, a few. Um, the design squiggle came out in 2002, and it was a way to describe the design process and, you know, this sort of messy thread that we had to get through, and at the end we could get focused, and we'd somehow unraveled that design challenge. And I think we're in a day where, actually, I'm going to suggest that designers need to reimagine that they might need to be staying on the left side in the mess a little bit longer because suddenly the challenges of designing for a more sustainable future are a lot more complicated. And 
this complication is also about reimagining our human centricity and with no ill respect to Mariano's technology and all these really interesting things, in some ways, some of those things have the potential to also go in a bad way, like everything. And they can be challenging for us. So I think this is really interesting. There's a global competence uh, that identifies 66 ways that we are different. So if we're designing for a socially responsive future, what are the differences between us? And one that, you know, there's many, facial expressions and nonverbal behavior. I think it's really interesting to think about crowd or audience behaviors. I often notice that when I'm speaking. Some people are very engaged or laughing, and some people it's not cool to laugh. Um, so thinking about that, what are the impacts of that as we design in different cultures and different scenarios of, of humanity? So one of the first things, I'm going to talk about three, one of the first things that I think must exist is radical curiosity. In an age where, and myself included, this is not a guilt trip, in an age where I spend a lot of time looking down uh, and trying to find my way to this location but needing the map and not sort of trusting the instincts around me to get me anywhere, um, I think radical curiosity is one of the biggest skills that a next economy designer needs. Um, so if there is no gap between what we know and what we need to know, we stop being curious. So some of the things I would love to challenge in the design community is that we don't make everything so easy for everybody. Because then I don't need to know anything anymore. How many of you go, oh, remember that thing? And we don't even give it a minute for it to process in our brain and we're already Googling it. We're already trying to find the answer so quickly. But I think if we're going to have a sustainable future, not everything needs to be fast. We need a little bit of curiosity between the spaces. This is a great model as well. I love models, so I warn you. Um, frameworks and models are a way that I can think about the world. And, and this one is, a, is about looking at our stages of competence. So if you start with me up in the top left, there's a moment in time where we're unconsciously incompetent. We don't know what we don't know, so it's blissful. It's a lovely place to be. And for many of us, when we started in design, we wanted to make a difference in the world, but there was a lot of things we just didn't know. And so we couldn't make a mistake of designing something that wasn't the right thing to design, but we had learned a new skill or we had learned a new tool and we wanted to make something. But as we go through this process, we become conscious of our incompetence in our awareness. And you know, then you start to realize, oh, I don't know this and I'm very aware of it and that can make us feel a bit insecure because then we're not really sure what to act on, what to make, how to build it. As we continue our learning, there is a place where we feel like we've arrived somewhere. I am consciously competent, I know this, and I'm good to go. But real mastery gets us to a place, and we often talk about it as flow, gets us to a place of unconscious competence. We don't know <laughs> that we know, and we're very freed up. And I think in an age of trying to design for sustainable futures, we're, we're not in a mastery place. And as designers, it can be a place where we feel a little bit insecure. Because when we don't know something, we're not in flow. And then we maybe don't make the best decisions because we're trying so hard to catch up in our learning. So I found this quite comforting as a framework because I could really start to understand why does it feel like in some cases when I want to design something with a better material or I want to reduce the impact of the thing that I'm making in the world, why does it feel so hard? It's because I haven't mastered a whole other layer of information that's needed for me to be able to deliver on that. This was a study that was done um, based on Todd Kashadan's work around curiosity. And I find it really interesting um, that there are different ways that we can be curious. So the ways are on the left side of the screen. Some of us love joyous exploration. Raise your hand if you think you're in that group. No one in this room. Yep, we've got joyous explorers. Some people like actually find curiosity through being deprived of sensitivity. So has anybody gone into a dark room and been in a totally, those dinners where they totally put you in the dark room and you don't know what's happening, but it's kind of like, Ooh, what's happening? I'm kind of curious about this. Some people um, like actually to have stress. And stress is what pushes them to be more curious. 
and others are just socially curious, and I'm sure being here in Milan during Design Week is a great moment for social curiosity because you're watching all these people from all these different places coming in and how do they interact and what's going on, um, and quite fascinating. And then some people are just thrill seekers. And when they did a survey of designers, this was how it scored. So a lot of people in design like social curiosity. We like to watch other people. We like to watch other things around us, and that informs our design. For some of us, we are really high in the joyous exploration. Some of us are thrill seekers. But what I think is most interesting, as you're picking up probably on the screen, is that designers don't like stress tolerance as a general rule. It's not our favorite place to design. It's not how we want to design. And yet I would argue that we're living in a state of the world right now where everything is around stress tolerance. The world is at war. We've lived through a pandemic. We're asking ourselves what's happening. Why are droughts and floods and all of these things happening affecting the climate? And now we're being asked to design in that. And I find that a really fa fascinating proposition for what it means to be a designer in the next economy. One thing I want you to do right now, I want you to join with me. And I want you to take a moment, and I want you to look around this room, and I want you to identify five things you can see right now. Just name them in your head. Now I want you to do four things you can hear. Three things you can smell. Two things you can touch. And touch them appropriately. And one thing you can taste. When I started doing this exercise, I started to realize like you get panicky, like I don't smell anything. <laughs> Like, what's wrong with me? Or I don't taste anything. But I think it is a moment of curiosity to reawaken our senses. So much of my sensory experience often comes in a digital space. It's my job, it's, it's the Instagram, it's the thing, it's the communication, it's finding my way. But getting outside of that, I think, is a real invitation to the design community. You could argue it's to the world, but I'll call out the de design community. The second one is ecosystem empathy that I think is really important for designers. And by that I mean what we are often called to do as designers is focus on designing for individuals and often an action or a moment in time. So I design a chair because I'm going to design for sitting at that chair. Or I'm designing an app to help you get from point A to point B. So I'm designing for an action. And it's a moment. It might be for seconds or hours that I'm thinking about my design impact. But as we move outwardly, you start to realize that we must be aware, for the reasons I just mentioned, that we need to design for ecosystems. And what I mean by ecosystems is actually thinking about the whole planet and over time, for centuries. And so much of what we see in the design space or policy, you can actually be part of thinking about how the object or the service might be impacted at the top. I have lots of questions you can ask, so if you want to, I can send these out later, however I get those to you, tweeting something. Um, I love these questions, but the idea of asking 78 questions about anything you design, most designers would be like, I don't got time for that. <laughs> That's too much. But I like thinking about the environmental, social, moral, aesthetic, ethical, practical, vocational, political, and metaphysical questions around every design. And one that's very obvious is, where does it go when it's broken or obsolete? And that's one we're still not really good at yet, but I think it's definitely on the table for conversation. One of the companies, startups, we've had the privilege to work with, I love, is asking those kinds of questions. And so this is an organization, a startup in Berlin, called Made of Air. And Made of Air wanted to have uh, an opportunity to not just make something um, carbon neutral, 
but make it carbon negative, meaning it does not let carbon back into the atmosphere. And in this case, what they did was they actually have taken wood waste and they've turned it into a biochar. And when you turn it into a biochar, it actually sequesters the carbon. It holds the carbon in and it will never be released. And what they do is turn it into a thermoplastic and it's harder to see on this screen the powerful kinds of objects you can make out of this material. Um, but they've done partnerships on with a brand to make sunglasses. They've done the sides of actually buildings. And the interesting thing is the only color you can make it in is black because carbon is black. And so it's really sending a provocative message about the materiality of what it means to sequester and to regenerate without giving an emission out back, back out into the world. Um, so I find it a very powerful story about being a regenerative maker, about actually thinking about, no, I'm not going to make this in many colors. I'm not going to make it so that it does m multiple things. I'm going to think consciously about what I need to do to send a message back to society uh, about what's important. And so we talk about them as an ingredient brand. So they add an ingredient to make something else in the world work. So I started with this. I'm like going in even closer. What I think designers for the next economy need to do is, is realize you're here and you need to find others. Because the only way to unravel this kind of complexity is to continue to have conversations, I tell people, you might need to think about yourself as more than a designer. You might need to think about yourself as a botanist or a biologist. In Mexico City, a few months ago, I even met somebody who's a designer who decided he was going to become a part-time farmer because he realized the materials he was using, he needed to understand how he was going to keep the soil good enough so that he could grow the plants that he needed to design the materials he needed to design with. So part of his time is farming and part of his time is designing. At Frog, this is a, a famous phrase for us. It's really the questions we're asking. Is it that we make the right thing or do we make the thing right? So asking ourselves, do we even need to make this? And if we do need to make it, let's make sure we make it right. And, and with all of those reasons that I've spoken about today with you. If you're interested in learning more about how we think about sustainability and going beyond, we do have a report we've published online. It's called Going Beyond Sustainability. We've got some great videos and nice voices from different people that we are connected to. And other than that, I say thank you. Grazie. I don't know if we are supposed to have time for questions, but if anyone has a question, we're, we're, we're here to answer. Yeah. Come on down. Did anyone watch The Price is Right? Is that just me? Very North American. Thank you. Uh, I just would like to ask you uh, things about the innovation about uh, um, textile and fabrics that I saw from the first uh, presentation that uh, maybe if it is possible to think about uh, this kind of technology about uh, sensitive textile also in thinking about uh, sustainability maybe if it is possible to apply this on natural fibers instead of plastic or polyester or polyamide or maybe could be an idea about uh, reusing existing thread uh, and not uh, uh, using the new one. So maybe it's a, a prototype, uh, and you are not allowed to tell more, but it uh, would be interesting to know if you already think about uh, this in sustainability way. Yeah, I think uh, there are different levels of value in this type of transformative textiles that integrate uh, like uh, either uh, technology or different type of uh, fibers react that react in different ways to different conditions, which is temperature and so on. One level is that uh, by having this change, you can, uh, for example, create one garment of one size and then it adapts to your body size uh, when it's maybe reacting to certain heat. Uh, uh, in that way, you produce probably less uh, because it's not. Uh, many uh, many variations it's one that adapts to your need 
Um, then, of course, there is the big research about um, um, more sustainable materials and uh, recyclable fibers that uh, are maybe coming from uh, still oil, but at least they can be recycled like polyester. And there, th those uh, uh, like uh, combination of uh, um, fiber composite could really have uh, as much as possible usage of recyclable uh, um, yeah, polymers. Uh, uh, but then another like uh, p big research is really about having biofibers and uh, and integrating them in a way that uh, they have other type of performances that than the fibers uh, from nature that we know today. And uh, so there are different researches there. Uh, what we shown before, it's a bit of a work done by the MIT and the self assembling lab together with the Ministry of Supply. Uh, especially in regard to having this type of fibers that change uh, given uh, environmental uh, conditions that you that you pose that uh, makes uh, the textile behave and not static as uh, as usually is but uh, for sure it's a big um, uh, area in the in the fashion industry this research of uh, fibers and and materials that can be more sustainable in terms of different levels being more recyclable, more coming directly from renewable resources, or introducing uh, changes in uh, in the structure that uh, uh, are uh, maybe changing the behavior of uh, of uh, users. I don't know if I answered, but uh, I mean it's probably expanding a bit the topic uh, rather than having it direct. Uh, Uh, I think sustainability is a very important topic for us, uh, Gen Z and millennials. Uh, um, are the company, not Cup Gemini and Frog, the, the, the whole world of companies, are the company leaving space to young designers to change the company structure to focus on uh, sustainability projects? Justo? Modetto giusto? I'm not sure about <laughs> So the thing that I do like about the company is that it has a large um, mission and mandate to reduce carbon footprint, reduce our emissions, to help our clients do that. And we've set a very big target for that. I think the reality is how that takes shape is in part how much somebody knows what they can do, so has the skill. So one of the ways we're trying to help the younger, or I wouldn't say it's younger, it's everybody, um, to upskill is designing trainings and, and ways to equip people. Um, I think, if I may say, I think Frog is a pretty open culture. It is a place where people can begin to explore and I often say it's a place to ask for forgiveness, not for permission, um, in a healthy way. So I think there's a lot of things that, that help to push this. The other thing that we're doing is even if a client doesn't ask us about sustainability for their project, on every project, and it doesn't matter what your level is, you could be a brand new frog, net new on the, on the project, you can be what we call a program adv advocate. And in that case, you go on to the project and it is your job to kind of be the sustainability p police, really, and to ask everybody, why are we doing this? So it's something we've just launched in the last couple of months and it's starting to take shape and people are starting to have a voice, not because they're the leader, not because they're the top dog of the company, but because they are able to have permission to ask challenging questions about the work we do. Cool? I can't speak for other companies, so it's kind of hard for me to know, um, but maybe Mariano, go for it. I think, uh, very often we are briefed uh, from our clients uh, with specific projects really looking at what are the motivators for the Gen Z, for the new generations, and uh, at the core of this ask there is always the sustainability as a, as a key principle to, to navigate and understand what does it mean sustainability to, to young generations. How do they see manifestation of that that work and are reasonable 
and uh, and then from there we need to design so a lot of what we we plan to do in these cases is really researching and uh, interviewing and and really working with young generations to understand what's their uh, perspective what is um, their their mindset really to 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 embrace maybe something that it speaks about more sustainability and uh, and and that's the a bit really the approach of going uh, with uh, really talking and involving uh, end users in in what we need designed for the future I can go, thank you. Um, yeah, as you said, uh, sustainability is the hot topic now and the clients are also uh, considering it. Um, even if maybe they are not on this path, but because they, they feel the need of uh, being in this path somehow uh, due to the, the external um, context also they are in, we are all in. Um, but I, what I want to ask is like you, um, as I as I observe, as I as I follow you, uh, you have a um, rather provocative approach on sustainability, uh, saying that if it's not necessary, let's not do it. So how I'm I'm curious, how does it sound for the for the clients? How is the approach to that? We are we are now all want to be in this thing and like being a you know sustainable company, being a B corp. They, they are all things, but. How does it sound to the in the in the practical level? How does it sound to them, and what is their reactions actually? I think it depends what country you're in. In some countries, there's regulations that make it very easy for us to have that provocative conversation. You're going to be charged for how much you emit, um, how much you have to report on. If you're familiar with Scope One, Scope Two, Scope Three emissions. Getting to scope three emissions means it's like if you were a, a reseller of something, you have to talk about what you resold, not just the thing that was originally sold. So I won't go into all of that. But in some countries, that's our best friend, is policy. In other places, it's more of a, shall we say, a wooing. You can do this. This will be good for you. And in some cases, it's the motivation of what are the customer data telling us they're not going to buy their product or they're going to boycott their product. Some of our clients are pushing the needle farther than we are. And so I like to talk about clients and, and, and the way that they think about it. Some of them are on the sidewalk, some of them are in the slow lane, and some are in the fast lane. And we get to work with all of them, di varying degrees of commitments and, and things like that. But a way to know if a client is committed is to look at things like, did they do a pledge on the science-based targets initiative? which is a basically a declaration. Now, lots of people can pledge. It doesn't mean that they're actually following through. I think annual reports, again, are a hint. They're not, they don't give everything away, but they are a hint to see what that reaction is. But for me, sometimes it's just saying, with this program advocate way of looking at our projects, is to say, in our kickoff meetings with our client, could we introduce something? And we'll get a really quick read if they're ready for this or not. But we don't really give up there. We just continue to say, well, what if you thought about it this way? And we always try to also crunch numbers for them, not just in some sort of ethereal way to make the world a better place, which is the right answer, but often hard to do. So we try to balance it with real practicality uh, and real groundedness in their business, but also what are some possibilities that they can pivot with. So the answer is it depends. <laughs> Cool. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're really glad you came. I think we have the best view of the city tonight, but uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of Salone. Thank you.